Okay, here we go. Thank you for joining us for another great event in our Nature of Writing series. It's a partnership between Village Books and the North Cascades Institute. The North Cascades Institute is a conservation nonprofit based right here in Whatcom County with a mission to inspire and empower environmental stewardship through transformative educational experiences in nature. The Institute uses education and hands-on experiences out in the natural world to connect people to this special place, believing that connection leads to care and caring for a place leads to actions to protect and restore them. Their home base is the North Cascades, Environmental, North Cascades Environmental Learning Center on Diablo Lake in North Cascades National Park, but they offer learning adventures throughout the whole ecosystem from the San Juan Islands to the Hundred Acre Wood in Bellingham to the Methow Valley. The Institute is preparing to take dozens of local high schoolers on nine-day backcountry camping trips in the North Cascades with their Youth Leadership Adventures program in July with the goal of inspiring a lifelong conservation ethic in the next generation YLA is a learning experience designed to serve local teens from counties that surround the North Cascades the Institute has a keen interest in especially reaching people of color LG LGT LGTBQ youth and low-income students pardon me What's more, for over half of the students, it was their first visit to the North Cascades National Park, while more than 75% said it was their first time participating in an outdoor program. Upcoming ways for you to get outside learning with North Cascades Institute include a wildflower wander at Stevens Pass, wildlife tracking in the North Cascades, and a class on pollinator diversity in Mount Vernon. You can learn more about on their website at ncascades.org, which I'm going to put in the chat. And that's where you can sign up for their monthly e-newsletter and find links to their popular Instagram and Facebook accounts. Okay, so let's get started. First, I'd like to introduce another of our partners in this event. Michael Fearer is currently the executive director of the Whatcom Million Trees Project, and he's here to tell us a bit about their important work. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Claire, um, and, and thanks to Village Books and North Cascades Institute and Jane and, and everyone else that was involved in helping to make um, this event come together. Um, I just, but before Jane starts um, and before introducing her, I, I wanna just take a few brief moments to uh, share my screen and just show, uh, uh, talk for a couple minutes about what, what Walk a Million Trees Project is about. So let's see if I can do that successfully here. Come here. Okay. So hopefully you see a slide with a forest showing our mission. And for those of you that don't already know, uh, Whatcom Million Trees Project's mission is to plant and protect 1 million trees in Whatcom County over the next five years. And it's for climate and biodiversity reasons and to enhance the health and resilience of our local communities. Um, and I, I just want to say it's plant and protect. So we're very active in protecting uh, legacy old growth um, trees, uh, with particularly in the Lake Whatcom watershed. And we're also involved with developing uh, new policies for uh, the city of Bellingham and, and other jurisdictions for tree protection. So there's really both pieces there. And you can see now that we have um, uh, kind of nine types of, or categories of projects that we uh, are involved with, ranging from reforestation and critical habitats to all the other boxes you see there. We're trying to think big and innovatively in our work. Sorry, just a moment, Michael. Uh, there actually are no boxes on my screen. I'm still seeing the trees, but. Uh-oh, <laughs> all right. Well, somehow we got, okay, let's try one more time here. Thank you for that, Jane. Let's try a different way here. Well, worked earlier, not sure what it's going on now. Let's see here. Now, now do you see the nine boxes? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyways, we have these categories of projects, but we're trying to think big and innovatively and we're trying to fill some of the niches of areas where there's not planting or protection being done by 
other nonprofits like the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association and Whatcom Land Trust. So if you go to our website, you'll see a whole lot more about all the kinds of innovative projects that we've been proposing or, or, or already starting on. And then just one more screen. Hopefully you're seeing work party people now. Are you seeing that, Jane? No, okay, we got the same technical issue here. So I will do it a different way, which is this way. Now, hopefully we see work party people. And um, so anyways, just to mention that uh, throughout the year, especially in the fall and winter, but also running through the spring and summer, we have weekend work parties of volunteers and um, of, at different parks uh, at first and locally here. And so that's uh, another way you can be involved with us besides, you know, you can volunteer at work parties or you can help with our admin task, or of course you can donate if you wish. Um, and thank you already for those of you that have bought a book, you know, Jane's book, because a little piece of that actually is, it was a donation to Walk a Million Trees Project as well. So thank you all for that. And um, that's, that's all I wanna share for the moment, but now I would like to have the pleasure to introduce Jane. And um, let me just find my right screen here now that I'm all thrown around. So Jane Billinghurst is a nature lover, master gardener, editor, translator, and author of six books. She's translated and edited several books by Peter Wollobin, uh, including the New York Times bestseller, The Hidden Life of Trees, which as some of you may have seen in movie form uh, as a Walk a Million Trees event uh, late last year. And she lives in Anacortes, Washington, not that far away, next to 2,800 acres of community forest lands there. So Jane, take it away. Okay, now I get to the, do the exciting bit of screen sharing. <laughs> and... Uh... <laughs> We will see if that yeah. is going to work. Make sure I've got my little, there we go. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really excited to share some of my forest experiences with you. And I thank Village Books, Watcom Million Trees and the North Cascades Institute all for co-sponsoring um, this event. Um, I'd like to say right at the beginning that I'm not an expert. Uh, Peter Wallaben is the forester and the expert, and I am there as someone who is learning all about the amazing things that you can find in a forest, and that's what I'd like to share with you tonight. I like to think that I'm learning slowly in a somewhat sedimentary geological fashion, immersing myself in knowledge, some of which settles and sticks and some of which flows away. But it doesn't matter. I know the forest is out there just waiting for me to learn more. So all the photographs um, in this presentation are ones that I have taken either in or around Fidalgo Island. And uh, as Claire said at the beginning, if you have questions or you want to share any forest experiences of your own, please put them in the Q&A, which I'm sure Claire will help me monitor later. Um, and I'll try to leave a few minutes at the end of this session so that we can address them. So as you step into a forest, you immerse yourself into an ecosystem that the trees have created. The air is full of oxygen released by leaves and needles as the trees make food out of air and sunshine. The trees, both alive and dead, aided by mosses, store water which they then release to create the kinds of microclimates they enjoy. While you're out in the forest, you can eavesdrop on trees as they release chemicals into the air as they exchange scent messages. And some of these chemicals are antibacterial and antifungal. Uh, they are, after all, the tree's defense mechanisms. And so the air really is cleaner in the forest. Under your feet, trees are exchanging messages and shuttling food to those that need it via the fungal threads that crisscross the forest floor. The fungi, in turn, are exacting payment for their services in the form of some of the sugar that the trees are busy producing to fuel their growth. It's estimated to up, that up to one third of the sugar produced by the trees goes to feed their fungal networks. And trees aren't the only plants that um, partner with fungi 
to grow more efficiently. In fact, most plants do this. The majority of plants do this. So out in the forest, it's a busy place and there's always something going on. So this branch on the top right, by the way, um, is a Western hemlock, one of the main species in our area. I snapped this photograph this spring at Dugala State Park on the north end of Whidbey Island. And it shows the tiny pink cones that are starting out on the branches where last year's cones are still hanging on. So hemlocks are shade tolerant and grow under the Douglas firs that dominate many of our forests here. When the dugs age out and die, which can take a thousand years or more, the hemlocks and the other dominant shade tolerant tree in our area, the Western Red Cedars, will take over. But right now, the hemlocks and the cedars are biding their time. So a few thoughts before we step into the forest. The first thing has to do with really looking, not just glancing superficially, but slowing down and looking at the details. This can be incredibly rewarding. So as Michael said, I live in Anacortes next to nearly 3000 acres of forest lands, which are meant much of which um, there are uh, Douglas firs growing. Um, I have Douglas firs in my yard. I've lived here for nearly 20 years. And yet it wasn't until I sat down with a nature journaling class with friends of the forest and had to draw a Douglas fir cone that I noticed the mouse tails in the cone even though they had been around me all of this time. I had never really looked. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with the story. Many years ago, a fire was raging through the forest and the mice were running and the mice needed somewhere safe to be and the Douglas firs offered them sanctuary and the mice are still there to this day. If you take a look at the photograph on the right, you can see that the mouse, mice made a very good choice by finding sanctuary with the Douglas firs. By the time they get to be about 40 years old or so, they've uh, got a really good coating of uh, rugged insulating bark, which will insulate them from forest fires that run across the forest floor. And we're seeing this in Anacortes right now. We did have a forest fire at Little Cranberry Lake and the big, large Douglas firs with a good coating of bark um, are doing just fine at the moment. And here's another thing in terms of paying attention to what's going on around you. You often don't see things if you don't know that they're there. So a leaf like this came up on one of the social media pages that I follow and I thought that is so cool. I have never seen that and I need to find one of those. However long it takes, I'm going to find one. I stepped into the forest across the road from my house about 20 feet down the trail I found one of these and then another and then another and then another. They had been there all the time, but because I didn't know they were there and someone hadn't pointed them out to me, I had not actually seen them. So this is an Oregon grape or Mahonia leaf. It's a dead leaf. And as it was dying and as it's dead, a fungus have, has uh, decided to take up residence there. The black lines on the leaf are the demarcation lines between the individual fungus, fungi, and the, um, the black spots, the big hexagonal black spots that you can see here, here, and here, these are where the spores of the fungi are residing. And when the fungus is ready to release its spores, it'll kind of open like a trap door. At least I just read that a few days ago. So I'm imagining a sort of rocket launch thing going on. So of course, now I learned that the next time I go out into the forest, I will be looking for these leaves again, but I will be looking even more closely to see if I can find open trap doors about on them. And so it goes and that you go deeper and deeper um, into the system. And bear in mind that the forest is a dynamic ecosystem. And this means that even if you were to do nothing but walk the very same trail every day, there would always be something new to see. As the plants grow, windstorms calls, lichen covered branches to fall to the ground and animals pass by. And even if nothing changed, there's still so much to see that every time you walked, you'd notice something that you'd never noticed before. And for this reason, when you do a forest walk, I suggest you choose a focus. It's fine to be distracted and change your focus once you've embarked on your walk, but you will see more deeply if you look for one thing, 
at a time. So sometimes I'll be looking for fungi and sometimes I'll be looking for mosses and sometimes I'll be looking for slime molds and, and it might depend on the time of year. So in winter, when there's not much else that's out and green, it's a great time to look at lichens in all thy diverse diversity. And then in spring, I've been looking and learning more and more about wildflowers that are out there in the forest. So now I'd like to show you some of the things that I have found and hope that you will be as excited by them as I am. Um, and then you'll have new things to look for when you next go out into the forest. So first of all, I'd like to talk about lichens. So lichens are actually a combination of a fungus and an alga. So the, like, the fungus provides the physical structure, the house, if you will, and the alga photosynthesizes to provide the food. So it's a perfect partnership. You've got a home and then you've got uh, one partner provides the home, the other prov provides the food. But once the partners are combined, they stay joined for life and fungi that have chosen to live life as, as lichens in this lichenized form, they can never go back to be freeing, free living fungi on their own. They only can survive if they can find an algal partner. So lichens come in three main forms. There's crustose lichens like this one here, which are flat and fairly firmly attached to the surfaces that they grow on. They can grow on wood or they can grow on rocks. And sometimes the ones you see on rocks could be yellow or red in color rather than green. Um, and that's a kind of a sunscreen that they put in to protect themselves from the sun. But the ones we see in the forest, um, they're in shade, so they, they're nice uh, green color. Um, this one here is actually called um, Fairy Bath. They got some great names. Uh, and uh, apparently it glows uh, under UV light. So there's something else that I ne now need to go and uh, check out. And then you have fruticose lichens, like this usnea in the middle, this thread-like lichen. Um, and the long fungal threads of usnea are stretchy, which I really like. In fact, I was walking today with some friends and uh, the usnea we picked up was a little bit on the dry side, but if you get a nice moist one, it's a great thing to do with kids. You can play with stretching them. Um, another form of uh, these fruticose lichens as they're called actually have little stalks and cups. And we'll look at some of those a little bit uh, later. Uh, and then on the right, we have folios or leafy lichens, which are absolutely um, beautiful, I think. So lots of animals use lichens as food, shelter, nesting materials, flying squirrels here, northern flying squirrels use lichens to line their nests. And reindeers really do eat reindeer moss, which is actually a lichen um, and not a moss. So I mentioned that a lichen is a partnership between a fungus and an alga. And actually that's not quite true. The fungi that form pelt lichens have either one or two partners. This one has partnered with a green alga, but it's also partnered with a cyanobacterium or a blue-green alga. And this is what you can see in the little blue spots here. And what's really cool about cyanobacteria is they fix nitrogen from the air. So all plants need nitrogen uh, to grow. You know, if you go out into your garden, you'll be putting down a fertilizer, especially in your vegetable garden uh, with that contains nitrogen to help the plants grow. And so in the forest, this is what these pelt lichens help do. They fix nitrogen from the air and put it into a form uh, that's available for the trees uh, to grow. You can think of it as the, yeah, the fertilizer uh, of the forest. And now I just throw in that one. Oh, so this is another pelt lichen. This one on the left, you'll see it's a different color. It's a dark color. And this is because it's actually partnering just with a cyanobacterium or blue green algae. Uh, this one's sometimes called dog tooth lichen because of those orange uh, bits that stick up like this, a little bit like teeth. These orange uh, pieces are actually where the spores of the fungus uh, are, are held of the fungal partner. So it will release the spores and then those spores need to find its photosynthesizing partner, its alga. And once it does that, it can create um, a new lichen. And here on the right, you can see the little holdfasts, the rhizines that the pelt lichen use to attach themselves to the surfaces on which they grow. These pelt lichen are usually found on the ground. Um, and I find them a lot 
uh, growing in moss that is on rocks. So rocky balds, uh, rocky outcrops are a great place to look for them or the side of the trail uh, where there are rocks and where there's moss. And uh, they're much easier to spot uh, in the winter than they are now when there's so much else that's growing up in the uh, forest. Uh, so here's another lichen. This one is called Lobularia. It's another nitrogen fixing lichen. You don't see the cyanobacterium, the dark blue color because it's actually within the body of the lichen itself. This one is hugely important to old growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's been discovered that they get about 70% of the nitrogen that they, the trees get about 70% of the nitrogen that they need to grow just from uh, this lichen. And those orange spots are the apothecia again, those uh, spore bearing uh, areas on the lichen where the fungal spores will be released. So I mentioned that folios lichen also come as little stalks. So here are some um, stalk-like lichens. These are cladonia called pixie cups. Uh, so lichens can reproduce by breaking off. They can reproduce by fungal spores. And another way they can reproduce is these granular areas here in these picnic pixie cups contain a little bit of fungus and a little bit of alga. And so these can then disperse and they're ready-made little packages to grow when they find a suitable spot. And what do we got next? Oh, and this is just to give you some kind of uh, sense of scale. So these uh, stalk lichens, these cladonia on the right, they have the red tops, which is where the spores are released. So they're sometimes called lipstick lichens or British soldier lichens because of these red caps that they have. Uh, but this is where I found these at the base of a Douglas fir that was growing around Little Cranberry Lake in Anacortes. So they're teeny, teeny, tiny. But once you start looking for them, those little bright red spots really begin to jump out at you. So as I mentioned at the beginning, trees are actively creating the kinds of conditions in which they like to grow. So that is a cool, moist microclimate. And one of their partners in this endeavor is moss. So moss can hold up to 20 times its weight in water. Um, and you may have heard that, you know, if you're lost in the forest, you can find out where north is to see so you look at the moss growing on a tree and it'll be growing on the north side of the tree. Well, as you probably know from walking in our forests here, moss seems to grow absolutely everywhere. And this advice is not really going to be very helpful to you. But where moss actually grows is where moisture um, gathers on the tree. So this is one reason why it doesn't grow very much on tall, straight conifers where the water tends to just come right down the trunk or if it's not raining heavily, actually not reach the trunk at all because the branches are organized almost like tiles on the roof. And so the area around a conifer trunk is often um, quite dry. But if the conifers grow bent, like this one is here uh, around Little Cranberry Lake in Anacortes, you can see that it's got a nice growth of um, moss on it. But the trees on which you will mostly find moss in our forests are the big leaf maples. They have uh, nice cracks and crevices in their bark um, where the, the moisture gathers and it gives the moss a little place to get started to grow. And in fact, the moss starts growing when the maples are just small. And then as the maples grow larger, the area of moss expands. And in, if you were to take that moss off the big leaf maple when it's mature, it would be difficult for another uh, moss to start growing in that area because by then the crevices and cracks are just much uh, larger. So the moss that you see on the big leaf maples is probably as old um, as the trees um, itself. And one sort of very rough way to tell if what you're looking at is a moss or a lichen is whether you feel like stroking it. So if you go, yeah, I think I'd really like to stroke it, it's probably a moss. Uh, and if you're not so sure, it might be a lichen. But of course, like any rule, that rule too will have its um, exceptions. There are so many different kinds of moss in our forest that I haven't even 
sort of dared to get too far into moss identification. But what I have been doing is looking at the little spore heads that moss use to reproduce. Uh, moss like lichen can reproduce by breaking off little other little pieces, um, but they also like lichen um, and fungi, they release spores. And this is what their spore heads look like. You can see that they're on little stalks and then you have the capsule that contains the spores up on the top here. This was um, again an, in Anacortes near the little Cranberry Lake area. There's this little cap on the, uh, on the top of the uh, capsule. So here are three different views. So here you've got, um, and they, depending on the kind of moss, they're different sizes, they're different shapes, they're different colors. So here's just a selection of some that I have found. Um, and here's one that's still, this is called the spear stage. It still has its little cap on uh, at the end of the capsule. Then the cap drop, drops off and it reveals something that's called an operculum. Operculum means trapdoor, basically. And these are tiny little teeth that keep the spores inside the, the capsule. And then these teeth open and you can see the spores uh, being released. There. So one of the things that I love to do with moss is to uh, capture all the different uh, images of their spore heads and see how many different ones I can find. And they come in really beautiful colors and shapes. And then one day when I was looking for moss uh, spore capsule, I found this glorious thing. So little black and brown spore heads on these wonderful translucent glassy uh, stalks that almost look like uh, glass noodles or something. Um, and this is actually liverwort, not moss. So they're very similar. They're not vascular plants and they don't have roots and they just absorb water. But I'm not going to go more into the differences between liverworts and moss because actually I don't know that much about it. I'd have to do more research to give you helpful information there. But I will say, if you see this, you know it's liverwort and it's absolutely gorgeous. This I found at Douglala, and then I also found at Dogwoods of uh, Dogwoods on Guimas Island, which is a really nice uh, private um, woodland that is open for people to walk. And as the name implies, dogs are welcomed. And it's called Dogwoods because Guimas was the place where the local indigenous peoples raised woolly dogs for their fur that they brushed and then they spun and then they wove into their blankets. So dogwoods on Guimas is a wonderful place to go. So I went back um, a few days later to see what the spore heads would do. So first of all, they opened and you could see the spores here. And then the spores, as they began to release, they revealed the exterior of the spore capsules. And then in the final stage, after all the spores were gone, you left in these beautiful, tiny, dark stars on the forest floor. It was just lovely. So we're going to switch from tiny, tiny things to somewhat larger things. So I wanted to take a look at one of the carefully calibrated relationships in the forest ecosystem. As I mentioned, a forest is not static. There's always something going on. Something is growing, something is decomposing, and there are lots of plants, animals, other life forms that are involved in this process, this constant process of life, death, decay within the forest itself. So it's said that a dead tree is worth more to a forest than a live one. And part of this has to do with the fact that a dead tree, a standing snag, provides great habitat I mean, I'm sure you've all heard uh, pileated woodpeckers about this time of year or a little earlier in the year, hammering away at trees, both to find the insects that are living in the trees, but also to create nesting cavities. And there are birds that use cavities in, in trees for their nests, such as wood ducks or owls, and they use either natural cavities or cavities that have been created by the woodpeckers who moved on and decided it's time uh, for a new home. So an owl that's nesting in a wood, woodpecker cavity, it can't make that cavity for itself, but it can move into a cavity that has been made for it 
Um, I saw a couple of woodpeckers actually in uh, Duglala when I was there doing the liverwort. And it was like one, I think it was the poor male was going to the tree and sort of pecking away. And then it seemed like the female came along and said, no, 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 that one's not going to do. And then they rushed off to another tree to find um, a place where they could raise this year's brood. So what's important when these dead trees are being decomposed, so the woodpeckers help uh, promote the process by opening the tree up so that it can be <clears throat> colonized by fungi and by little creatures that break it down. Because trees need nutrients to grow, they make their own sugar by photosynthesizing, but they need extra nutrients as well, which are locked up in the old trees. So the trees can't move to a new place and new soil to find the nutrients they need. Um, so decomposing wood is a very important source of nutrients that are being recycled as the old trees break down, they're producing uh, nutrients for the new generation of trees to grow. And one of the uh, life forms that helps do that is uh, fungus. So here we have uh, red belted conchs and they are growing in uh, dying or dead wood. Um, and what these drops here you see on them is called gutation. And I'm not sure that people really know exactly what gutation is and, and what um, function it performs, but you often see these conchs um, producing uh, these uh, droplets of moisture. And you can tell whether a conch started to grow on a, a tree while it was upright or um, a log after it lay, is lying on the ground because they always grow perpendicular to the ground. And the reason for this is they release spores as mushrooms do, but they are a type of fungus. They release spores to reproduce and they want to keep their spores dry. So they always have the shelf, the top facing the sky and the bottom facing the ground so that when their spores come out, they're nice and dry and they can drift off with the breeze. And here's another variation on these polypores, these um, uh, fungi that uh, grow out from trees and help break them down. This is a turkey tail or could be a false turkey tail, another area where I yet need to do more research to figure out exactly um, what, uh, what it is. Um, but they're also doing their bit to break down the wood to release nutrients for the next generation of trees. And, uh, it can take um, up to 600 years for a downed Douglas fir tree to decompose completely. So you could see it as the ultimate slow release fertilizer. So nurse logs lying on the ground are not only releasing nutrients, they're also great places and sometimes the only places in a forest uh, for new trees to start to grow. The forest floor can be so covered with underbrush that it's difficult for new trees to start, get a start in life. And in the Ho rainforest, which is where this photograph was taken, it's estimated that 70% of the white spruce get their start in life on a nurse log. So if they're on the nurse log, they're closer to the light. There's always moisture available in the rotting wood and there are nutrients in the debris that gets caught in the rotting wood. Uh, nature never plants in a straight line. However, if you do see a straight line of trees, it could be that they all got their start in life on um, a nurse log. So not all decomposers in the forest are fungi or bacteria. There are other decomposers hard at work, turning the debris on the forest floor into smaller and smaller pieces. And I'd like you to meet a couple of our local decomposers. Um, I'll say first that, um, Earthworms are not beneficial decomposers in our forests. They're fine in your garden, but uh, not in the forests. Um, and the reason for that is that they decompose things too quickly. They go through the forest duff too quickly. Um, and so we don't have that nice uh, spongy layer that collects moisture and allows new plants uh, to get a start uh, in life. And so they are a problem. And the reason they're a problem is because of the ice age. When the ice came down and covered this area, it destroyed the trees and it also destroyed all the earthworms. When the ice receded, the trees came back 
And they came back with their own set of decomposers, decomposers that decompose much more slowly. So um, here we have the seven spotted, the yellow spotted uh, millipede. Centipedes are carnivores and millipedes are herbivores. This millipede's coloration is advertising that it is not, wor not worth attacking or eating. Yellow and black are universal warning colors. So think yellow jackets or caution tape or the signs we human use, use for radioactive waste. And so to, to defend itself, this millipede gives off just a hint of cyanide, which has an almondy smell. Not enough to harm you, but enough to make it distasteful to potential predators. And if you pick one up, you might want to wash your hands afterwards. And I give you a pro tip here. You can sex millipedes by looking at their legs. On the male, so they have, this one has, I think about 20 body segments, but on the male, one leg on the seventh segment is slightly shorter than the others. And this is the leg it uses to transfer sperm to the female. So next time you see one, you can have a go at sexing it if you like. And next we come to the banana slug, one of my favorites. This is the second largest slug in the world. The largest is a sea slug that's up to three feet long called the black sea hare. So this makes the banana slug the world's largest terrestrial slug. Apparently they grow up to almost 10 inches long. Um, I have to say I've never seen one quite that size, although I have seen some quite big ones. So I caught this one who bring up some vegetation looking distinctly past its sell by date in Silver Lake County Park up there in Whatcom. Slugs and snails don't have teeth. Um, instead, they have what is known as a radula, which is basically a really raspy tongue. And this is why slug damage on your lettuces takes the form of holes rasped in the middle of leaves um, rather than nibbles around the edge. And uh, slugs also can leave this kind of damage on mushrooms. They like to eat mushrooms because they're nice and soft. And you can see this one, which was actually growing almost in my front yard, has been nicely licked by a slug uh, to show its interior. And here's an image of that, those uh, little teeth all on that raspy tongue that the slug has. Um, oh yeah, a few more things about slugs. Um, you've probably seen them gliding along the forest floor, dragging an arrangement of debris from their rear ends. This is not slug poop. Uh, slugs de defecate from an opening in their mantles up near their heads. So this is debris that has gotten stuck to slug slime. Slime is expensive to produce, and, but it can be recycled. And debris is a drag, and debris is also lunch. So every once in a while, a slug will stop to snack off its burden some package and cut down it on its need to make more slime from scratch. Um, and back a, a month or two ago around Whistle Lake here in Anacortes, it was the first time I saw this process in action. So this slug curled up and began to snack on the debris stuck to its slime on its uh, rear end. And incidentally, if you see slime that's a continuous trail, then it's been made by a slug, left by a slug. And if you see slime that's in little dots, it means it's been left by a snail. Unfortunately, I don't know why they leave different slime trails. So another thing that goes on my to-do list and something that I need to look up. Uh, slime is amazing. Uh, slugs can produce it to go over really sharp things, all those little eggs, egg shells or whatever you might put around your vegetables to try to keep the slugs away. If they really want to get in, they will just produce more slime until they can get over. It can also be sticky so that they can climb up vertical surfaces and they follow slime trails to find another slug to mate with. Um, it just any slug will do because slugs are not he or she, they're they. Um, and uh, slug slime, also is, makes it difficult for other animals to eat um, slugs. So garter snakes get their, their mouths gummed up when they try to eat slugs, but raccoons know that what you need to do is you need to roll your slug in dirt first, and then it's much easier to get out. Oh, don't do that, by the way, because slug slime is a vector uh, for disease. Although I have heard that it's also good for toothache, 
oh, that's uh, what the indigenous peoples in this area did. But I think the mere idea of putting a slug anywhere near your mouth would be enough to cure the toothache without actually having to pop it in there. So there's one more relationship in the forest ecosystem that I'd love to talk about. So we've got the three main, there's three main types of fungi. You've got the fungi that eat live trees and kill them. You've got the fungi that break down dead and dying trees to recycle nutrients. And you've got fungi that need their trees alive. These are the trees in the fungal networks that use trees used to commute. These fungi are the ones in the networks that the trees use to communicate with each other. They are essentially an um, extension of the tree's roots. So the trees can re reach more nutrients and more water than they can with their roots alone. They also connect the trees to one another. So the trees can send message, well, the trees can send sugar from one tree to another. And this is the sugar that the fungi take some of for themselves. And the trees can use this fungal network to send messages to each other. The trees on the edge of the forest can say, hey, it's getting dry here. You guys inside, dial it down a bit on growing. This is gonna be a tough year. You don't wanna be growing too much. Or they can say, hey, I'm getting eaten by caterpillars. You guys over there, you might wanna start putting toxins up into your leaves, nasty tasting substances, um, so that the caterpillars don't eat so many of your leaves. So they use them in various ways. But this is where mycoheterotrophs come in. So this here is a ghost pipe. Um, it is a plant. Uh, it's not a fungus, um, but a plant. It's a plant actually in the blueberry family. And over time, it's lost its chlorophyll. That's the green coloring in a plant. As it has no chlorophyll, it can't make any food. <clears throat> so where's it gonna get food from? Well, it turns out that it intercepts, well, actually it steals from the fungus, some of the sugar that's been coming from the trees. And that makes it a parasite. So it is a mycoheterotroph, heterotroph because it can't make its own food. It has to get food from another source. We, we are heterotrophs. And myco, because the source from which it gets its food are the, fun, are the fungi, uh, and it's in the form of the sugar uh, that is coming from the trees. Um, and mycoheterotrophs, like the ghost pipe, are associated with particular fungi. In this case, a ghost pipe is associated with uh, mushrooms in the Russulacea family, which are also in turn associated with Douglas firs. Um, here's another mycoheterotroph that's out there in the forest at the moment. This is the coral root orchid. Uh, it too feeds on the sugar that's going from the trees to the fungus. And here's one, um, here's a, as it's beginning to grow, and here it is just about past the um, peak of blooming. So like the ghost pipe, it doesn't really have any need of leaves because it's not photosynthesizing. Uh, so it's just got the roots and it's got its flowers. Oh, and by the way, with the um, ghost pipe here, you can see that the flowers are drooping down. They droop down until they're pollinated. And once they're pollinated, they stand more uh, upright. So that's just a little fun fact about the ghost pipe. Let me see, was there anything else I was gonna tell you? Oh yeah, so if you are a mushroom hunter and you want to find a certain type of mushroom and you know what mycoheterotroph is associated with them, you can go earlier in the season, check out if the mycoheterotroph is there. And then later in the season, you can go back and find the mushrooms you might be looking for. So um, now I'm gonna switch um, gears and I'm gonna talk, talk to you about um, slime molds. Um, I'll just take you on a brief tour. Sorry, I think I've been talking a little longer than I was anticipating I would. Um, so slime molds are found all over the world. They're not animals, they're not plants, and they're not fungi. They're lumped into a catch-all category of life called protista. And the ones that we find in our forest are plasmodial slime molds. They're single cell organisms with multiple nuclei and that they, this, they form a blob which moves around very slowly as it feeds on bacteria and algae uh, in the forest. And here's one that's difficult to miss. It's called the dog vomit slime mold or if you prefer scrambled egg slime mold. This one was about the size of my fist, found it up near Whistle Lake. 
Um, slime molds are not harmful, they're not toxic. Uh, this one you might find in your yard if you have wood chips that you're using as mulch. They disappear once they've spread their spores and they need moisture to move. And they move in a kind of a pulsing, throbbing motion that you can actually capture on camera if you have more patience uh, than I do. And some slime molds are really good at solving spatial puzzles. Uh, there's a famous experiment where scientists in Japan laid out the stops of the Tokyo subway system, placing oat flakes at the stops and bright lights where there are obstacles, and then they let the slime molds get to work. And slime molds don't like bright light um, and for some reason love to eat oats, even though there are no oats in the forest. So off they went from oat flake to oat flake, avoiding the bright areas. And when the slime mold was done, finding the most efficient way from A to B, around the obstacles, the researchers ended up with a pattern very much like the transportation grid created by human engineers. So slime molds are actually uh, grown in labs to do this kind of problem solving, and they can be used for things like determining efficient routes for fire escapes out of a building. Uh, so when they want to reproduce, so they move as a blob as they're eating, and then when they want to reproduce, they find a high spot and they stop moving and they produce spore heads, sometimes in quite spectacular um, fashion. So here are some tubular slime molds. Um, these, um, they start as little sort of round, round dots and then they create stalks and then they grow these tubes that change color from white to pink to, to um, dark brown. And if the one that does that is called a steminitis or a chocolate slime mold because it's dark brown in the end, then in its final stage, it produces spores and it disappears. And here on the right, you can see a slug snacking on the slime, on the slime mold. And this area of slime here is not from the slug, it's actually from the slime mold as it moved and aggregated to create its um, spore heads. Um, another thing that eats slime molds are little beetles that have spoon shaped mandibles to stuff the uh, spores into their mouths. And I was so excited because I found one of these guys last week in Washington Park. And here he is on that chocolate slime mold, scooping up those spores into its mouth. It's absolutely amazing all the things that are going on out there. And here is just a little close up um, actually on the same log where I found this beetle, but um, at a different, um, in a previous year. So here are the thread-like stalks with the tubular spore heads, which then change color to this lovely glossy brown. And then eventually the brown spore heads um, take on a more powdery appearance. The spores are produced they, um, and they fly off in the wind. And here's a little arthropod checking out the action. There's an uh, arthropods are basically a sort of phrase for all the little critters that are running around on the forest floor. And there is an arthropod specialist in Oregon who says that by examining the arthropod community in a soil sample, he can tell what time of year the sample was taken, whether the slope was north or south facing, what the understory plants were, what the successional stage of the forest was, and what trees were growing in the vicinity. So much information from such tiny critters. Anyway, I'm not sure we can get much smaller than this, so this seems like a good place to end the presentation. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can. Uh, for I post uh, images of what I find in the forest fairly regularly. It's Jane underscore Billinghurst underscore writer. Um, don't forget that if you're interested in getting a copy of, book, of the book, Village Books would be a great place um, to get it from. And I have not been monitoring the chat or the Q&A, so uh, maybe Claire, if you can tell me if there's anything up there that I should know about. Well, um, I encourage folks now absolutely to start put, popping some questions into the Q&A if you have them or into the chat. That would be that would be great because now is definitely the time while we have Jane here with us to answer all of our questions. I want to say that those photographs were just just so amazing <laughs> yeah, and Thank i take you. them all with i take them all with an iphone so i have a, a moment lens that's made in seattle actually which is a 10 times lens that i can i have a special case for it and i can put it on and then i just have a tiny little clip-on lens that was very inexpensive that i got on the internet and um 
I use that for the super close-ups like that little arthropod um, admiring the slime mold at the very end. That was great. I love that. That was wonderful. Um, so, so Anne is asking what camera equipment and lenses are you using? Yep. Just, I just got this, yep, this is and... my iPhone. That's, that's great. Isn't that amazing that you can, that, yeah, the technology. How did your interest in the forest ecosystem develop? That's from Donna. She would like to oh, know. Well, I, I grew up um, near Woodlands in the UK. Um, beautiful, uh, uh, deciduous woodlands covered in bluebells in the summer that is in, in the spring. That's still one of my favorite places to be. But when I started working with Peter uh, some years ago, I would use my master gardener knowledge to help me with the translations that I did. But then I also wanted to learn more and more about forests to work well with him. And then when forest walking came along, um, my husband and I took a four month 17,000 mile trip around the United States so that I could get familiar with all different kinds of forest ecosystems around the country. So we went from here down through the Redwoods, down to Big Bend, Texas, up the um, bottomlands forest of the East Coast, um, up through um, the deciduous forests of uh, New England, up into Quebec, and then across to, uh, Canada and the US and, and back here. So it's, it's a journey and I'm learning all the time and I get to be a slower and slower and slower and slower and slower hiker by the day. And I learn something every day. And as you know, from the presentation, there are still so many things that I don't know. And one thing leads to another. And Jan Janice would like to know how you, did you get interested in the micro connection? Yeah, I, I think just because, um, they don't run away. <laughs> they stay there. And then oh. slime molds were so fascinating because they change so quickly. So a staminitis can go from a little, little white balls to those chocolate tubes in two days and then they're gone. So um, it became, and I think also because not so many other people were doing that. So it kind of gave me an area where I felt I wasn't breaking new ground, but I had the feeling that I was learning something um, a little bit special. So yeah, just that's how it happened, I guess. Okay. And I also want to invite people, if, if anyone has any questions for Michael and about the work that the Watt Chameleon Trees Project does, uh, please feel free to ask those questions as well. Um, I, I'm just curious. I would just like to know what it's like working with Peter Wallabin. Uh, well, Peter is a wonderful person. Um, and he really wants to communicate his love of forests to people. He's really... He's really laid back. He's really positive. He's really excited about the forest. So I guess that kind of rubbed off on me and made me want to learn more about them uh, myself. But I would just say in general that he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's a really nice guy, really positive guy, and uh, really wants to make a difference and really wants to change the way that people look at forests and understand forests. And he's currently working in Germany on a uh, university level course for ecoforestry so that foresters in Germany can be trained somewhat differently to see forests as ecosystems that have more than just um, an economic value. Um, yeah. hmm. Wow. And do you plan to work with him on future projects? Oh, yes. He keeps... <laughs> Does he, yes, keep, does in, he keep contacting you? <laughs> uh, he keeps work. Well, I work for the publisher and the publisher publishes okay. uh, Peter's yeah. uh, work, but I've just finished work on a book called, well, at the moment it's called The, the Promise of Trees. And he's talking about the importance of old growth forests, of old mm -hmm. trees, and how trees over the long, long lives learn how to deal with different climate situations. And they um, have that knowledge stored in their seeds and they pass that down to the next generation of trees. And the longer a tree has lived, the more knowledge it has to pass down. So if you keep cutting down old trees and just replacing them with young trees, you're losing this huge store of knowledge that could be useful um, in terms of climate change for the future. So yeah, it's a really interesting book and I've just finished working with him on that. And then as he's uh, working on this eco-forestry course, he's got more and more things that he wants to t tell people about the ecological value of trees. So I think that we'll be working for a little while longer together. Great, that's, that's wonderful. Michael, do you have any questions for Jane? Putting you on the spot. Well, I, I just noticed there in the chat, there was a, another question. That oh, I missed it, in. excuse me. 
says uh, by Colin uh, Christopher says, what, what's the best or your favorite book written by a Pacific Northwest indigenous person that explores their ancestral knowledge, stories and relationships with trees? Um, well, I have to say that I don't have one from the Pacific Northwest, but I am a big fan of Robin Wall Kimmerer and her books, Gathering Moss and um, Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, Gathering Moss in particular, because I'm into the small things I thought was absolutely fascinating. And I love the way that she integrates uh, indigenous knowledge uh, with, it's like we have science that's just beginning to catch up with the relationship that indigenous peoples have had with the land and the understanding that they have had about how valuable these ecosystems are to our own existence. We are not separated from them. We are a part of them. And if they thrive, we thrive. Absolutely. I have another question too, if I may. And that is, I'm curious if uh, in your explorations in the Pacific Northwest forest, um, if you've seen anything that you would attribute to evidence of a change in, in due to climate change, you know, in terms of the kinds of small details mm -hmm. and things you're noticing? Yes, well, I'm not sure that it's small details, but I know that here in Anacortes in the uh, community forest lands, Transition Fidalgo is partnering with the city to do um, forest monitoring. Um, and we're certainly noticing that a lot of juvenile hemlocks um, are not doing well in certain areas of the forest. In certain areas, you know, every tiny bit of the forest is different, what grows there, what thrives there. But it seems like the mature hemlocks, which have extensive root systems, are still doing fine, finding enough water. The young hemlocks, the very young hemlocks that are sprouting and beginning to grow seem to be doing okay. But the sort of juvenile teenage ones that are not really big and robust yet, but have outgrown, uh, you know, they, they're needing to get more water are the ones that are actually suffering and dying in our forest lands right now. So that's an ongoing study that we're doing from year to year. And, and we're feeling at the moment that it's because of drought, uh, a series of, of years of drought that is affecting them at this particular stage in their life. So yeah, our forests could look very different. I'm wondering about like at the smaller level of like slime molds and fungi and microorganisms. Do, do you, have you, you know, I would imagine that drier um, summers, you know, hotter, drier summers might have an impact on them. Is that true or, or not? Well, I know that the, I mean, the slime molds particular, have a particular combination of uh, moisture and temperature that they enjoy. Like right now we're seeing a lot of Serratio mixer, a column, coral, a white coral slime mold that is out there in abundance. They it just must have hit a, a sweet spot, but then they turn into spores and those spores will uh, wait until the conditions are right to be growing again. So it's difficult for me to say at that level, you know, are they doing better? Are they doing worse? Certainly in the long run, um, slime molds do need uh, moisture because, you know, that's how they, they move and find food. They can only move as, a, uh, as an organism if they've, they've got enough moisture inside them to allow them to pulse forward as they do. Well, I do not see any more questions. This is, this, folks, this is your last, your final chance. So um, in the meantime, um, I want to encourage people to, of course, um, check out villagebooks.com where we do have um, all of these books available, um, as well as please check out uh, ncascades.org where you can see where, uh, check out all the work that the amazing North Cascades Institute does. Um, and then of course also the Watt Chameleon Trees Project. Um, this is this is my favorite kind of event right here, this, this sort of partnership. Um, so I think going once, going twice. Um, do either of you have any parting words for our audience? No, I would just say happy forest walking. And I do hope that as a result of this uh, presentation, you might be going out there and looking for a few different things or finding what inspires you. I like to learn, you know, delve in and learn about the things, but there might be a completely different aspect of the forest that you find enthralling, either just finding beautiful patterns in nature, or maybe you want to find what you can eat, which is not an area that I go into at all, but you can find your own relationship with the forest. This, to, this evening has just been a taste of the kinds of things that are out there, but you know, go out on your own, find out what you get inspiration from under the trees. 
And I just want to add a brief thing. So uh, Walk a Million Trees Project is happy to bring events to, with our partners like those books like this together because while our role is to plant and protect a million trees, one way that we help to make that happen is by education with the community. And so this is a, you know, awareness and education kind of event that we loved hearing about, you know, when we uh, first were in touch with Jane. And so, uh, so thank you again for being a part of it tonight. It's, um, it's wonderful when we have such amazing resources so close to home that uh, are, are, you know, know about the forest so deeply. And I just wanted to make one small point. I see that someone says, I look forward to reading the book and seeing all the amazing photos. This isn't actually a photographic book. There are a few photos of my own in there, um, but there are just a few of them scattered throughout. The point of this presentation is just to say that if you do go and explore the forest in the way that the book encourages you to do, these are the kinds of things that you could find. Right. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. And it is a lovely little book. So... Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, North Cascades Institute. And I think with that, uh, we will say good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night.